Did I just hear what I think I just heard? <laughs> let's let's play that again one more time. Deja vu. I just been this place before. Okay. I gotta say, these recent episodes of Tokyo Ghoul Re's anime have made me extremely happy. Seeing episodes like this that cut out very few details, stick to the manga, and I get to see a proper anime adaptation, it makes me happy because I love Tokyo Ghoul. It's one of my favorite series, and just seeing once again another great episode, I'm like, keep this work up. I want more of this because now seeing these recent episodes consistent, good episodes, I mean, besides animation, obviously, and certain questionable sound effects, but I mean, besides that, I mean, if they can keep this consistency with the pasting to the actual adaptation-wise, I'm looking forward to the second half of Tokyo Ghoul Re. As you know, it was announced for this to have two cores, it's gonna have, like, 20-something episodes, so that does mean that there will be more after we finish this anime season, but... Uh, as I've heard, it's apparently coming out in fall, so we're going to have a little bit of a break. But the big point is, is that Tokyo Ghoul Re will return, and if they are going to be continuing this pacing and the quality of the adaptation, then I am actually, for once, looking forward to the next episode. So, I'm honestly surprised that I'm praising the anime series of Tokyo Ghoul Re this much. I figured by now, it would have already done a slip-up. It would have looked absolutely horrible. For instance, the adaptation-wise, it just made me be like, really? You had a good episode, and then you go downhill. I thought something like that was going to happen, but clearly that is not the case, especially with these recent, like, three to four episodes. So just job well done. But okay, so let's get on topic. What did they do right, and what did they do wrong? Now, in terms of what they did wrong... The only thing that is really worth mentioning is this panel right here. This panel where Kaneki or Heisei Sasaki is decimating the white suits by himself. This entire panel was pretty much cut out from the episode. And I know in a lot of ways it's a little bit of a nitpick, but at the same time I was looking forward to seeing how Sasaki's strength was showcased in the anime. For instance, him just completely demolishing the white suits like it is nothing. And if there is one thing I have noticed when it comes to the recent episodes, even though it has been a very good adaptation, if there's one thing that has truly been terrible, it is definitely the fighting the animation to the fighting, which is something that completely surprises me, because I remember back in Season 1 and Season 2, even though I complained a lot about the series, I was always just downright hating on the anime, the fighting always kind of looked good. But now looking at these recent episodes, it's kind of like fighting has been completely just thrown to the side, and then they focus more on the quality of the adaptation, which, you know, I'm not complaining. You know what? I'm not complaining. I'd rather have a better adaptation the beautiful fighting segments, because fighting is not what the series is about. So, I mean, I'm fine with it, but I am a little bit upset that I didn't get to see that panel adapted, just showing how Sasuke was just completely demolishing them like it's nothing, and that's one of the big scenes that was kind of removed from the episode. Besides that, I guess you have some censorship, which makes sense. I mean, that's nothing to really complain about with the whole tongue scene with Kijima, with, you know, the tongue being completely censored. I mean, there wasn't really much that really upset me or anything that was removed at all. Um, if there's one little piece of dialogue that was removed though, it was dialogue about when Sukiyama was talking to Heisei Sasaki when he was sitting on the bench with him, and he's like, I bet you like, you know, Eto's books, her works. And that scene had a little bit more dialogue in the manga to where it kind of expresses what type of person Kaneki Kin was, but also who Eto is as well. For instance, Kaneki kind of analyzes, or Heisei Sasaki, correction, he analyzes Eto's work, and it's like, the author of the books must be incredibly lonely, sad depressed, feels like the world is, you know, not worth anything, feels like the world is already broken and doesn't really know what to do, like the person just wants to break the world and stuff. So when you see that dialogue from Tsukiyama and Heisei Sasaki's, you know, convo, you're like, whoa, this really gives some insight to how Kaneki is as a character for him to really love those type of books but also for Eto to write books like that. It just, you know, shows the mentality of her personality. And it was really great characterization and build-up for her for future events of the story of Tokyo Ghoul Re. So seeing that dialogue kind of cut, 
I mean, it's nothing too, like, drastic or major that ruins the story. It's just a little tidbit that I think could have been a lot better if it was added, but it was not. Now, um, let's also talk about the stuff that was done very well with this. And I have to say, I really, really love, I especially love the scene with Tsukiyama stalking Kaneki, trying to, you know, get him to remember or have a proper conversation with him. That entire segment was absolutely hilarious. I, I, I love that scene of the episode, just seeing how Tsukiyama, he was acting like this anime kid, just watching his idol and all that, trying to get Senpai to notice him. I'm like, this is so cute and adorable in a creepy stalker way. And... Pretty much seeing how this man was getting very upset with everyone that was around Heisei Sasaki, for instance, you know, Psycho, Shirazu, Uri, Mutsuki, and all that. When you see all of them surrounding Kaneki, you know, he's getting very upset. He's like, I'm not giving a chance to talk to him, and he's getting upset. And when he finally does get to talk with Kaneki, and he realizes Kaneki doesn't like the same books anymore, and, you know, he's a little bit different, like he doesn't recognize Tsukiyama instantly, he's like, yo, what? And you can see how he's a little bit upset about that, but he does not give up. Up, which shows what type of character he is and how much life he's been given in this episode. That scene also shows how much he's trying to improve and change himself, and he's like, not trying to give up. He's not wanting to give up on Heisei remembering himself that he was once Kaneki, and he's trying to remind him. And that scene shows that he's no longer wanting to get depressed, because the Kaneki that he knew is right in front of him, and he's trying to wake him back up, trying to get him back you know, to where he once was. And at the same time, is that really a good thing? That's what many should question themselves. Should Kaneki go back to what he once was? See, here's the thing. Right now, in the story, even though it's sad that Kaneki doesn't remember his past, he doesn't remember what happened to Hide, he doesn't remember anybody that was on the ghoul side or anything, like Toka or anything, the thing is, right now at this time, you could say that Kaneki, in some ways, he has a good life. Even if it is, in some ways, a false dream. And... Would you really think it's right to take that away from the man? Especially when it seems like he finally has something he always wanted. Which, anime only might not really understand this, but Kaneki has always wanted a family. Which is reason why Arima and, uh, you know, Mato, they are kind of representing, like, a father-mother mo figure. is because Kaneki's always wanted a family. He's always wanted parents. And having, you know, the investigators, the children, the QS and all that around him, it's kind of like he has his own siblings and stuff to, you know, chill with. He has his mother and father to, you know, have convos with. And this is the first time in Kaneki's life he's really gotten something that he never had throughout his original life. And so, is it necessarily right to take him away from what he is currently enjoying. Like, is it okay to wake him up and throw him back into the hellhole that he once was in throughout Tokyo Ghoul? So that is the big, like, I guess, conflict for this episode, what it was setting up. And there was some obvious hints that this was going on throughout the episode, but at the same time, Tsukiyama, he doesn't really care about that. Which, at the same time, even though he's a good dude, at the end of the day, you can see that he's trying to be a friend to Kaneki instead of wanting to eat him. He still is thinking more about himself instead of Kaneki's well-being and wanting him to be happy. You can clearly see by the way he talks or, you know, is trying to interact with Kaneki. He's not thinking about Kaneki's happiness, he's thinking about his own happiness. Then, eventually, we have it to where uh, Kane actually goes out of her way to have it to where Tsukiyama can interact with Kaneki without any interruptions at all. Now, that entire segment with the white suits popping up and, you know, Uri having this fight, Shirazu having this fight, I think they got the main points across to what you needed to get from the scenes, but in terms of animation-wise, it was truly lacking. Like, it was it was pretty terrible, I'm not gonna lie. Like, uh, the fighting really lacked impact. It, you know, looked very sloppy. It was just a lot of clashing and screaming which it didn't seem like that well orchestrated at all. I don't know, just the way it was done, it just did not, you know, fit the previous scenes throughout the episode, which is what I already talked about in this video, that uh, if there's one thing that the series has been lacking, it's definitely the animation department for the fights, which that's what happens when you outsource everything, and new studios, I'm assuming, or new teams are working on the episode every single week. So it makes sense, but at the same time, though, you could clearly see that in terms of the impact of the fighting, it was really poor and low quality, but I think, like I said, the main points of what you should get from those scenes, it was there. For instance, Shirazu, obviously, he's having PTSD. He doesn't know how to handle, you know, his new Quinque, which is Nutcracker. He can't use her because he, he's just... 
he doesn't know what to do. He, he killed a person that he thinks is actually a person and happened to use her. He's like, whoa, like, she's in a box and all that. I, put, I shoved this woman into a box and I'm using her like a weapon. He doesn't even know how to feel about that. You can see, and he completely breaks down and doesn't want to use Nutcracker. And then Uri is forced to fight by himself. And he confirms that he has gotten a lot stronger by being able to push the ghoul back that pushed him back a couple episodes. And then you have the stuff of Mutsuki, which I think that was, out of all these scenes, that was probably the worst adapted scene. The reason why I'm saying that is, it's because it was supposed to show how bad Mutsuki was with fighting. Like, she wasn't good with her Quen Kei at all. But, in the end, with the way the episode depicted it, it looked like Mutsuki was doing really well and pushed Little Ben back like it was nothing. And, I gotta say, I think that scene could have been done a lot better. But, it was nothing terrible that ruined the episode for me. But I think out of all these scenes, that was the one that kind of lost its main message. But it was very cool to see little Ben in action. I think many can agree, seeing a ghoul using a Quinque and all that instead of just a Kogane, it's pretty unique. You would think that ghouls would do that more, but then you gotta remember that Quinques are actually just ghouls turned into those. So, I mean, yeah, it makes sense why some ghouls wouldn't use them, because it's kind of like saying, hey, my friend got turned into a Quinque. Let me use them as a weapon. Y yeah, you, you could go figure why they wouldn't do this in the first place. So, it really makes you wonder what type of character this ghoul is for her to use, you know, Quinn case of actual ghouls. Why, why would she do that? So Psycho, her, her scene, it was different. Like, there was some dialogue, like, some clarification characterization to the character that saved Psycho. There was more details there about how the man only had, like, three fingers. He was messed up like a disfingered hand. You know, there, there was a little bit more details to the figure that saved Psycho. But the way they showed it in the anime, they really didn't need to describe certain features about the character. The reason why is, is because even if you're an anime only, like, you haven't even read the manga, I think you could kind of piece together who that is. It, it's very obvious, I Thing. But uh, that's pretty much about it. I mean, the episode overall, it does have some little few scenes here and there, especially with Kijima, and how this man basically doesn't like to follow the rules with uh, CCG. He's actually having to go into a meeting because, you know, he caused a big publicity stunt. He decided to put this public video of him interrogating a ghoul, cutting out their tongue and all that, and it was showed and broadcasted to everyone that wants to go to CCG's public website. So, obviously, he got into a lot of trouble with that, and he could potentially be off the investigation because of how he interacts with ghouls or how he handles ghouls which shows how he feels about ghouls in the first place. Remember what I said in my uh, previous episode review of Tokyo Ghoul Re? The reason why Kijima looks so messed up, why his body is so disfigured, is because a ghoul messed him up. A ghoul straight up ruined his face, his body, everything, and that's why he looks like he does. And like I said, it's based off of a game. You're not going to get those details on him unless they decide to add those details in the anime and make anime original scenes, but those details to Kijima, what happened to him, is from Tokyo Ghoul Gel, the game, and so if you want to know what happened to him, you can either go and play the game or just look up him up on the wiki, one or the other. But pretty much though, Kijima, the reason why he looks like he does, it, it stems from what happened to him in that game. And you can see that he has a lot of hatred, harbors a lot of hatred for ghouls because of what was done to him or whatever was done in his life. Because of just what he did to that ghoul, just, you know, going as far as to cut off their tongue, put it on a public site to risk his own job just to make a point or send a message. It's pretty cruel. But that's pretty much about it when it comes to this week's episode of Tokyo Ghoul Re. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Did you enjoy this week's episode? Did you hate this week's episode? If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And I love you guys. Chibi out.